So um, I'm actually not the uh, legendary voice of God. I'm the dean of the law school, uh, James Hackney. So very nice to uh, have you uh, here today. Um, good, again, good evening and uh, welcome to this celebration. This celebration of the launch of the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Burnham Nobles Digital Archive. We love the way that sounds, don't we? <laughs> yeah, well, maybe you can make some money on the side with it too, all right. Um, there are some moments in academia that touch both the minds and our hearts. Tonight is one of those moments. We take great pride in the work of our students and faculty in compiling this unprecedented archive of 1,000 murders in the Jim Crow South. Listen to that, folks, 1,000. We also take this moment to remember and honor all of those whose lives were lost so violently to the demons of racism and oppression. Since CRRJ was launched, we have seen the impact of how research can lead to restorative justice. Under the direction of Professor Margaret Burnham and Professor Rose Zotek Chick, we have educated our students about how to deal with legal research and investigations, how to think like lawyers, and how to bring justice to communities. With this archive, we have an opportunity for public justice and a broader conception of what public justice means, particularly where prosecution is not an option. Cases in this archive have and will continue to lead to memorials, educational programs, commemorative services, gravestones, and other forms of recognition. But now we have the evidence of those 1,000 cases in one place for national exploration around what can be done for descendants of victims and communities. How communities can be held accountable and how we can make reparations. We are proud of all that CRJ has accomplished. And yet, we must never forget that each one of us is called upon to do more. The racism we see and experience in our society in the past and today must be at the forefront of our thoughts, not just this evening, but as we move through our own lives. We must fight injustice. We must persevere against racism. We must use the archives to give rise to yet more scholarship and more opportunities for restorative justice. Through us, the archive must live and breathe and make a difference for the past and for the future. So now, with that introduction, I want to introduce Chancellor Nobles. I have a long ways to go. Oh, you're still, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm just getting started. You, you, you have your chance to talk. <laughs> it is now my pleasure to introduce you, uh, Chancellor Nobles, MIT Chancellor and Professor of Political Science, Melissa Nobles. Chancellor Nobles is co-author of the CRJ Burnham Nobles Digital Archive and was an initial founder of CRJ in 2007. She is the author of 
shades of citizenship, race and census in modern politics, and politics of official apologies. Since CRJ's inception, Chancellor Nobles has been a true partner to Professor Margaret Burnham, providing keen insights that have helped shape and bring theoretical rigor to the archive project. While Chancellor Nobles is not an official member of the Northeastern Law School faculty, we're delighted and honored to call her a member of our community. Chancellor Nobles. Thank you, Dean. I'm very happy to be an uh, honorary member of this community. Uh, Morgan and I will be speaking tomorrow at the conversation, so I'm going to limit my remarks here this evening uh, to the students. So uh, when, I, when Morgan and I first was talking about this and we each had different views, I was interested in coming up, you know, working towards uh, some kind of database that can be used in the social sciences to get a sense of the nature of, of, of these deaths. And uh, uh, both Morgan and I were interested in issues of looking backwards and making, thinking about how the law and politicians could be held accountable, or at least have a sense of the depth of their involvement in Jim Crow, since sometimes the representation is if black people you know, uh, created themselves, like we were oppressed, but there were no oppressors. So part of the thrust was to get at that history, which had been large, talked about, but never really fully investigated. It's as if we think about American history, and it's like slavery, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, Barack Obama, <laughs> and Civil Rights Movement, Barack Obama. And the violence that is the thread throughout has oftentimes been insufficiently understood and appreciated. So we start out thinking about that. But of course, you may have theories and you may have interests, but you need people to be invested and do a lot of the work in learning. And students were absolutely crucial to this. So when I first came on, started, I started attending the Grand Rounds. This was a new experience for me. We do have something in political science, but it's nothing like this. And so the students, and I was like, oh, little lawyers. So they were <laughs> presenting cases and, very, you know, and taking very well our uh, critiques and comments. And I noticed, and so that was a great part of it. And then I had the opportunity, Margaret and I would sometimes do road trips down south, and we would meet students who were there investigating their cases. And then they were in control, of course. We were observing. And it was just a treat to see them doing what they do, with the confidence, learning, creating relationships with the families, and themselves becoming deeply emotionally invested in ways that is kind of the best of education. You could say you want students to learn, right? But, it, but it, what, what Northeastern does so well is in this clinical program is getting students to have the real experiences and such. So I thought it was just a brilliant kind of exemplar of how learning, learning by doing, uh, uh, very much resonated with me and I could see the value of that. Uh, and then finally, I've gotten to know a lot of the former alums because they're deeply involved with the advisory committee. So now they're out in the world, successful practicing attorneys and doing other kinds of things with the law, kind of breaking all kinds of boundaries, and uh, they're all scattered throughout here today. I won't call names because I will not capture everyone. But when, you're, when I'm sitting in those advisory meetings with the former students, I'm like, this thing is going to have no problems because they, come to, they're not, they don't come to play. <laughs> they listen to us, and they, they give us very useful critiques. They're fully engaged. And it's clear in the decisions that many of them have made in their lives since Northeastern that this played a crucially important part in their, not only their legal development, but their human development. So I don't think that Margaret and I could have imagined, at least I couldn't have. I mean, Margaret, you know, she's, she's been my teacher. I met her at MIT. And I, look, your, I, before, I, before I became a professor, I was a student, Margaret's student. <laughs> in some ways, I continue to be. And so I just, you know, I, what I marvel at and, and, and what makes me most happy is the ways in which we have, the program and this collective engagement has advanced uh, legal knowledge and human empathy and development. So with that, thank you so much. Terrific, thank you, Melissa. So now it's actually time to meet and hear from our former uh, students. 
And I'll begin with um, Rashida Richardson, class of 2011. And uh, Rashida is uh, no stranger to our community. She's currently assistant professor of law and political science on the Northeastern faculty. Terrific. Uh, Rashida is on leave serving as attorney advisor to the chair of the Federal Trade Commission. We need you to come back soon, Rashida. <laughs> as a student, Rashida worked with Professor Burnham on the landmark case involving Charles Moore and Henry D., two 19-year-olds who were lynched in Mississippi in 1964. She also served on CRJ's Board of Advisors. Rashida. Thank you, Dean Hackney. Um, so first I want to say it's so great to be in community with all of you, and I want to keep hugging if you're cool with that COVID-wise as after we do this. Um, but for brevity and breath, I wanted to focus on three takeaways or what I would really say are gifts um, that I received from my time at CRRJ and that have really affected me as a lawyer today. Um, so first, CRRJ helped me foster a critical eye towards the law, which only in retrospect shifted me towards a career of working on complex or thorny policy issues, including HIV criminalization, school desegregation, surveillance technologies, and now technology policy on emerging technology issues like artificial intelligence. And I started as a research assistant for Professor Burnham and um, before the clinic launched, where I had the opportunity to search for sources of cases, meaning going down to the Boston Public Library and looking through public archives, um, investigating cases, like the, uh, well, I won't go through all of the different options, working on the D. Moore litigation and policy projects like the Till Bill. I started this work after my, first, my 1L year, so I was still learning the tenets and practice of law. But worked on these, work on, working on these projects helped demonstrate the de deficiencies and limitations of the law in deterring certain types of conduct and specific kind of actors, as well as its inefficiencies in redressing certain types of harms, specifically racialized harms. So even though I went into law school saying I would never work on policy, I think my time in CRRJ and um, and on the it, both in law school and in the advisory board helped me invigorate an interest in trying to both name and fix problems that I see with the law institutions and society, which I still do today through policy work and my academic scholarship. CRJ also helped nurture an understanding of harm, or as we call it in the law, injury. The law tends to have a fairly myopic view of injuries in society, which results in many forms of harm going unaddressed, as we all know from working on our cases. CRRJ works helps demonstrate this flaw because we both see that acts of racialized violence impacts families and communities, and it's also not temporally bound in that it can have intergenerational com um, impacts. And I myself am a product of the Great Migration, so that was one aspect of our work that always felt very personal to me. Um, and sorry, I really should have printed this a little bigger. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, um, but this also deeply influenced my legal practice um, because I always took a wider view to harms um, in my analysis of problems as well as figuring out a theory for change and how to address those problems. And a notable example in how this played out in my career was a school desegregation case that I worked on in Syracuse, New York, where we sought to use a highway reconstruction pro uh, project to redress various forms of segregation and social inequalities that happened um, in that area. And many of these harms stemmed from the original construction of the highway, which as many um, city, cities throughout this country tended to decimate thriving black communities. And um, through that work, we would work with commun the community members to connect those harms to the inequities felt um, today, and that helped de inform decisions about the highway redesign, and that work is still ongoing and was actually mentioned by President Biden in his project promoting the infrastructure law that passed last year. And then um, the third, speeding up because I know I'm on a time limit, 
um, is that finally uh, it's the restorative justice piece, which is a crucial part of the title, but also a crucial part of the work. And I think that has had one of the most enduring effects on me and that it, in the same way the clinic helped me gain a more holistic view of harm, it also informed how I thought about how do you redress that harm, what does it actually mean to make amends, um, especially given all of the deficiencies and limitations that I was appreciating about the law. And I continued to use those practices both in life and in the legal practice. Um, one thing that I'm very vocal about is that I've worked in a lot of toxic workplaces, but it's these types of practices that helped me figure out how to make things both safer for us as peers, but also to ensure that we were doing better work. And that's something that like still some of my friends from workplaces have been like, wow, I, that was actually one of the most impactful things that I experienced. But it also informs um, some of the work that I do specifically, some of my academic scholarship, because I work on issues around data-driven technologies and algorithmic bias that stem from many of the problems that we all are aware of, but how do you deal with those harms um, when they seem really abstract and disconnected is something that I continue to explore, but I really do think the impetus for all of those interests stemmed from CRRJ. Um, and I just want to thank you, Margaret. <laughs> um, and before I get emotional, I'm going to get off, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rashida. Uh, we now turn to Kaylee Simon, class of 2011. Wow, that was a great year. Uh, <laughs> who serves as Deputy Public Defender for Contra Costa County in California. Kaylee Simon set a high bar with her research on the John Earl Reese case, which involved a 16-year-old who was shot to death in a hate crime in 1955 in Longview, Texas. Kaylee organized a day of recognition in Longview and successfully sought to change the death certificate which had recorded Reese's death as a quote unquote accident. In 2018, Kaylee took a sabbatical year from her public defender position to return to CRRJ to direct its restorative justice initiatives and organize justice events in the South and other locations. Kaylee? Thank you, Dean Hackney. One of the best decisions I've made in my life was to attend Northeastern in order to study with Professor Burnham. Working closely with Professor Burnham and with CRRJ had a profound impact on my career and on my life, as I know many of you here can relate. Of course, through CRRJ, I gained hard skills that I use every day as a public defender, things that often are not taught in a law school classroom. I learned about how the criminal legal system works in the real world through the John O. Reese case, which Dean Hackney just referenced. In that case, I got to investigate the case and learn how to investigate. I learned that one of the white perpetrators was convicted but did not serve any time. CRRJ taught me how to interview people thoroughly and with compassion. And I learned from CRRJ that you always go to the scene of a crime to understand what happened and that you need to know the life history of everybody involved in order to understand the crime charged. But believe it or not, those were not the most impactful parts of my CRRJ experience. Having the opportunity to learn from Professor Burnham was and still is absolutely inspiring. She's a brilliant visionary who sees no limits to what obtaining justice means and her creative and expansive thinking is contagious. She lights a fire in all of us to think broadly about what justice means and what it can look like. And she also trusts her students in this unique way, giving us all of these resources to do things and try things that no lawyer has tried before. She encourages us and gives us permission to think beyond legal precedence to actually meet the true needs and desires of our clients. 
In that vein, I learned from CRRJ and from Professor Barnum, from you, even though I keep talking like you're not here, from you, um, that when appropriate, not to accept defeat. And as a public defender, at least where I practice, because of the way the system is structured, we often lose. Not always, but often. And we have to find creative ways to keep fighting and showing up for our clients, even though we often lose. And through the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project, um, I, and especially in that year in 2018, I had the opportunity to work with families who often wanted a, an apology from an official for what happened. And sometimes I would go to a mayor and the mayor would say no. And so I'd go to the sheriff and say, hey sheriff, you know, a deputy was involved, how about you apologize? And perhaps they would say no. So I'd go to a councilwoman and say, hey, can you lobby your mayor or your, or your sheriff to change their mind? And if that didn't work, I'd go to the press and say, hey, can you get a comment for why they're saying no? Um, I learned from this project to be persistent and to be unrelenting, and I carry that with me in the courtroom. Perhaps most importantly, what I've gained through CRRJ is a deeper appreciation that the entire criminal legal system was built to uphold white supremacy. And through having my hands and my eyes in the CRRJ Burnham Nobles archive, I really saw and understood that white uh, prosecutors and judges really were uncles and aunts with one another, that defendants and judges were going to church with each other you know, every Sunday, um, and black people were lynched without due process for crimes they often didn't commit or for alleged non-criminal acts like a comment or a look when lynchings themselves were not criminalized. And when they were criminalized, there were sham trials with the mere appearance of justice. And this history lives on in the current system. It manifests differently, but it is there. And when it takes a while for my black clients to trust me, and they think perhaps I'm in some kind of a relationship with the DA, I have empathy because of CRRJ for why, for where that history comes from, for where that notion comes from, I understand why, and I have empathy. And when my black clients are charged more harshly than my white clients, I object and I speak up about why. And when my black clients receive worse offers and harsher sentences, I object and I speak up about why. The work of CRRJ, and in particular the CRRJ Burnham Nobles Archive, fills a huge gap in our history about why we got to where we are today. The archive is an integral piece of our history that we must utilize and understand alongside the relatives of the descendants of those lynched to reckon honestly with what justice should look like today. And I'll continue to fight hard alongside all of you as we work towards obtaining true, genuine repair and justice. Thank you, Kaylee. Our third graduate speaker is Noah Lapidus, class of 2020, who now works as a genealogist research manager at Ancestry. A Birmingham na uh, native, Noah is a double husky, right, Joseph, we love double huskies, <laughs> who came to CRJ as an undergraduate when Professor Laurel Leff suggested CRJ would benefit from his skills as a genealogist and his interest in civil rights. Noah has helped CRJ find scores of families and has deepened CRJ's expertise in genealogy. Noah? Hello. Um, when I started at CRJ as a senior in college in February 2017, I, um, I had no intention of ever practicing law. And two months later, I applied to law school at Northeastern. And uh, that's because I'd met professors Burnham and Zoltik Jick, and uh, I wanted to be them. And, um, 
And so then through a Northeastern program, I, um, I was able to start the following August. Um, and uh, for the next few years, I uh, helped clinic students uh, identify descendants of the people in the archive. Um, and um, met Kaylee Simon along the way and a, a bunch of incredible people. Um, and uh, finally, I think summer before 3L, I got to do the clinic. Uh, and uh, like everyone else, I was assigned a handful of cases. Um, and, but but there, was, there was always one that really stuck. And the one that stuck for me was the case of Captain Leonard Butler, who I just heard Professor Burnham talk about on NPR, which was wild. And, um, and so Captain Butler was from um, the Black Belt of Alabama, moved to Jefferson County in the 1920s uh, to the Birmingham area where I'm from, and, um, and uh, found work at, as a miner uh, at Edgewater Mine. He, um, he joined his kids' PTA. He went to, he took a plane, a train, and a bus to get to NAACP meetings in downtown Birmingham. And um, ultimately, after spending, you know, uh, years in, in, the, in the mines, he decided to join the local union. Um, at... Uh, after a few years, he was finally elected um, vice president of the local, and that was the highest position that a black man uh, could achieve within unions in the South at the time. And um, he had 13 kids, meanwhile. So uh, a few years later, uh, he's accused of sexually assaulting a 13-year-old white girl, and two uh, uh, mine representatives shoot him. And... Um, and then uh, his, his widow was fortunate to find an attorney who would take her case to court and uh, ultimately won $10,000. Uh, there were wildcat strikes uh, staged by, you know, integrated miners, thousands of them. And, um, and uh, so I knew everything. I knew everything about this case. And so, you know, as I did, I identified uh, Butler's uh, descendants, and I did it very fast. And, uh, and so I found that he had three of 13 kids still living. And uh, so I called the eldest, uh, Vida, and I was excited to get on the phone with her, and I was going to tell her all about everything I'd found and how I knew everything about her dad. And um, so for, to just summarize that conversation or to give you an example of what happened, uh, I said, okay, so the census shows that in the city directories that your family moved from Edgewater to you know, Cap Town in, you know, 1943, she said moved. We were forcibly removed uh, to Capstown. Um, I said, you know, your case is extraordinary. Your family won $10,000, you know, I'm sure you blah, blah, blah. She said, how did that help when the KKK came to my house and harassed me and, and we had to move to Michigan like everyone else? Um, and, um, and I realized, I think, in that conversation with Vida that CRJ was never about well, it, it was. It, it was about Captain Butler, but to me, and it means CRJ means something different to everyone else, but to me it was always about VITA. And the VITA is that I think every clinic student here has their own VITA. And, um, you know, my VITA died the year after I talked to her during COVID, and I'm so glad I had that opportunity. And, um, and I hope she was too. I think she was. She told me that she had been waiting for this call. I th that's, what I, that's what all the clinic students heard. They had been waiting. And, um, and finally, she, you know, there was someone who knew about her dad. And uh, so I think about Vida all the time. And uh, Vida meant so much to me and CRJ meant so much to me that I am now a genealogist at Ancestry.com where I work with descendants as a living. You know, not necessarily descendants of Jim Crow era lynching victims, but descendants of enslaved people. And... Um, it's, it's all because of CRJ, it's all because of Margaret, it's all because of Rose. Um, I mean, my professionally, personally, um, CRJ is the most important thing to me. Uh, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Noah. Uh, we now turn to Tara Dunn, class of 2017, an associate with uh, Todd 
and Well Law Firm. As a student, Tara was deeply committed to CRJ's work. She investigated the Henry Pegg Gilbert case and then partnered with a student in the journalism school who, based on Tara's investigation, produced an award-winning film about the case titled The Lynching of Henry Gilbert. Tara? So one of the first things that they tell you as an attorney is to manage expectations. <laughs> I gladly stepped in for a colleague of, of, of mine that was supposed to speak tonight. Um, and I'm glad that Professor Burnham has so much faith in me. <laughs> um, you know, the reality is that it's difficult to boil down a truly transformational experience into a neat summary of the ways in which this project has shaped me as an attorney and really as the type of human being that I want to be and the type of contribution that I want to make while I'm still here to do it on this earth. And, um, you know, no judge or jury or partner that I work for or boss that I can work for will ever be more intimidating than Professor Margaret Burnham <laughs> and RZJ. <laughs> um, those of you who are students know what I'm talking about. Um, all jokes aside, um, it wasn't just the fear of entering the what I called the shark tank to talk about the progress of my case uh, that motivated me. Um, it was truly the client. And the person that I, or who I learned the person that he was. And, and the living family members that I had the absolute privilege of getting to know. Uh, his granddaughter, Henry Pig, Gilbert's granddaughter is here today, Sheila. Um, <laughs> and as I worked on this project, I truly, um, saw my family and them, for sure. Um, our client, Henry Pig Gilbert, was in his 40s when he and his wife bought 111 acres of land in the late 1940s, and he would later be accused of a crime he didn't commit, arrested, and lynched as a prisoner with the help and the participation of the Harris and Troop County Police near LaGrange, Georgia. I would spend the rest of my 2L and 3L year and beyond researching and investigating this story. But I will spend the rest of my life thinking about Henry Pay Gilbert, his legacy, his family, and the work that we were able to do on this case. I am a better researcher a better writer, and a better attorney because of this experience. But what I value the most is the imprint that it left in my heart for justice, the type of justice that wakes you up at night, and the type of justice that you continue to think about how you can fight every single day in the jobs that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Northeastern University President Joseph E. Aoun. President Aoun is an internationally... No, 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 no one wants to hear that. No one wants to hear that. Thank you. No. Thank you. Well, you I'm oh, here. I'm here, and we all know that. Joseph, Joseph, you will hear this. Joseph, everything that you heard tonight, that's what we're about. When we talk about impact, when we talk about you and your legacy and what you have meant to the university and support of fabulous professors and instructors like Margaret and Rose and our students and the real truth of experiential learning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me tell you something. I was next to uh, the judge and she told me it's embarrassing. So let's embarrass her more. <laughs> Please do that. Continue to do that all night long. 
Uh, James, thank you. Thank you for this uh, uh, great introduction. That's the greatest introduction because you mean it and it comes from the heart. So thank you very much. And let me talk about something that many of you do not know, and especially the alumni and alumnus who spoke uh, today and the chancellor. There, there was a real transformation, and you are seeing the results of that today with CRRJ. What happened is that Judge Burnham, the team, a, and worked in the law school, and they had the support in the, long, long, uh, in the law school. But we all realized very early on that this project doesn't belong to the law school. This project doesn't belong to the university. It belongs to society as a whole and indeed the world. So when we started working with Judge Burnham and the team, I saw that every constituency in the university embraced this project. Communications, you know, and here we have Mike Armini and Renata and their team, produced a beautiful, beautiful film that won an award. Dan Cohen, our librarian, built the digital archives. And that's a big transformation. Each one of you, when you spoke today, our alumni and our alumni spoke about the impact that this work has done on you. But also, there was an enormous impact on the families. And now imagine what's going to happen next. This doesn't belong anymore to Judge Burnham, doesn't belong to the university. It belongs to society as a whole. So we are expecting and we are hoping that thousands of families and students and scholars are going to access the archives worldwide. That's a real transformation. That's what you have done. And we did it because of the impact that you had on the families. And also, Margaret, we did it because of, we saw the impact that you had on our students and on the world. That's enormous. That's an enormous achievement. I want to say something here, and I mean it. I believe that this is the most consequential project and mission we have in this university. You embody that. You represent that. You are a giant, but you are a giant for others. And this is why, with respect and awe, and humility, I'll ask you to come next to me. The floor is yours. I call him Mr. President. <laughs> I call him my president because there were, uh, and I, I, I have my scholarly hat on, not my political hat, but there were a number of years in which he was my only president. <laughs> I am so grateful, so grateful to him, because uh, uh, President Aoun and I met uh, during my early years here, in his early years, uh, and he brought together a group of faculty members and asked us to go around the room and talk about what we were doing, talk about our projects. And I mentioned CRRJ and what it was we wanted to do. And from that very moment, he committed to this project. And, and not only did he commit to this project, but whenever we went to him, he was there for us. And obviously, a project like this requires resources. Uh, you don't build 
an archive like this on small change. And the first big grant we got was from the Carnegie Foundation. And I would never have thought to apply to the Carnegie Foundation, but my president called me one day and he said, put your name in, let's see what happened. And that $200,000 carried us over a huge hump. And it was seed money, and with it we got other money. So deep, deep gratitude to my president. I'm just gonna thank people because you guys have heard about what the project is all about. And I, I thank my students who've talked about the impact on them. And I wanna say, first of all, this is about the students, all of the students, not just students at Northeastern University School of Law from whom you've heard so brilliantly, just so brilliantly. I, I would hire any one of you at any of them. <laughs> just, I'm just so proud of you. Uh, as well, we worked with high school students from Cambridge, Ringe, and Latin, and they picked up one case at a time and took it south, and those cases are also in our archive. And the professors from teachers and community folk and students from, thank you so much, Larry. Thank you, <laughs> Janet Moses. They're all here. and. So we would not have, uh, we, you know, one, we, we would not have thought this project could be carried out by, by high school students, but we adapted it, and it showed also just the, the, the possibilities for the project. In addition to our law students, we had students from the School of Journalism and from the school from CSSH, it's a public history project. We thank them. Some of them are here. And not only uh, our law, our university, but as well, Penn State, there are students here from Penn State University who came to us every summer. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. And they're all in the room. Without our students, so many of you, so, so many of whom are here today, this would never, ever have been possible. And of course, we didn't start out with the intent of transforming you and giving you all you've described that has made you a better lawyer. We started out with the intent of making a, an archive that would have a lasting impact on our justice, on our sense of justice in this country. Without our students, we couldn't have done it. We also didn't really know how to shape this thing until we talked to Melissa Nobles. We knew we were collecting cases and helping people. Oh, look, Andrew is here. <laughs> we knew we were doing all that, but we didn't have an academic frame for the work until the chancellor came around and said, okay, we want to start in 1930 and end in 1954, and we want to cover, we can't cover the United States of America, we're going to cover these cases, these states. And she's brought that, uh, that uh, perception, that rigor, that Lawyers don't necessarily have, but political scientists and other social scientists, certainly she has it, and she's brought it to that project, and I am eternally grateful. As well, as well, as well, our classroom teachers, my partners in the classroom, uh, Rose Zoltekchik and Melvin Kelly. And and the first dean at the law school who said, okay, you give it a go, green light this thing, Emily Spieler, who years later came back and said, I want to rejoin CRRJ, and we are so grateful for her advice and counsel. I want to thank my staff, they're all here. I can't name every one of you. They come to work every day, COVID, no COVID. Whatever it is we need to do, thank you so much, Katie, all of you, thank you. And then the library, the library stepped up to the plate early in this game and said, Dan Cohen and others in the library, there they are, there's the library, <laughs> right? And said, they said to us, okay, you got a lot of documents, but they mean nothing uh, unless we can put some order 
unless we can create a, 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 a metadata, metadata, whatever metadata is, <laughs> they created it. And joining with our library helped us raise additional funds so that we could make this possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you, Giordana. Thank you, Gina. This project also moved along uh, over 15 years, really, uh, because we had colleagues across the country who were doing similar work and with whom we could decipher and talk about similar, project, similar problems. And they, too, are in the room. Hank Klibanoff, uh, and all the other Hank from the very inception, from 2007, from Georgia. We have colleagues here from Georgia, Minnesota, Texas. Is Texas in the room? Texas is in the room. Texas! Monica Martinez, who is doing exactly this work for the Latinx, Mexican, and Mexican-American community, 1900 to 1920 in Texas. So we have, we have uh, partnered and learned from all of these other projects as well. So I know I've left someone out. Jay. I love, did Jay. I leave? Who Jay, Jay, Jay. Oh, Jay! <laughs> Jay! <laughs> Someone had to collect the documents in Washington, D.C., without which we would not have had an archive. And so Melissa found this historian. There he is over there, Jay Driscoll, who spends hour after hour in Washington in the archive, NARA, and the, our Library of Congress, making sure that all the wonderful work that the students have done is actually accurate. <laughs> if some correction is required, Jay has been there for years to make that happen so that the product that we could put out, which we have now put out, thank you, uh, I won't repeat what the president has said about the impact on scholarship, on communities, on restorative justice, on our understandings of justice, on our teaching of this material, the impact that this product will have. We have enormous, we all, we all did it together. We have enormous hopes for this project. I'm gonna sit down in a minute, but let me also say that my dean, my current dean, my president, my dean, has been at our side. And he too has always flashed us a green light. Not as green as we would want it to be sometimes. <laughs> But he has been generous with his support in every way, and we thank you. If I left you out, it's not because I don't love you and thank you for all of your support. Our, oh, our communications folks over there. But um, it's time to get another drink and finish up some of these wonderful hors d'oeuvres and party. Party on, people. Thank you so much.